Hello, everyone. I am here with Dr. Bill Bankston, which is a great pleasure and honor. Dr. Bankston was president of the Society for Scientific Research for, I believe, 12 years, and also a professor of sociology at St. Joseph's College in New York, and many other distinctions, a professor of statistics, and he will tell us more shortly. And we are together today to discuss his research, his very groundbreaking and um, extraordinary research and findings. So thank you so much for being with me today, Bill. Oh, thank you for the invitation. It should be fun. I hope so. So um, I'd like to know if you, if we can start off by replaying a little bit how you came to this um, very un, 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 unusual, extraordinary line of work. I know you didn't start out as um, somebody who was initially interested or, or thinking of a career in this. So could you let us know how this all began? Yeah, it happened uh, as many things happen to many people, spontaneously, unexpectedly, confusingly, you know, and in hindsight, you might be able to tie together points A and B, but as you're doing it, I got nothing. Uh, so the, the very the very short version, way, way, way back, a long, long time ago in a place far, far away, um, it wasn't actually that far, but um, uh, I, I ran into a guy who claimed he was a psychic. And I didn't know all that much about psychic stuff, but I knew enough about research methods and data analysis and such that I figured, well, I'm a skeptic, so let's let's find out what, what can happen skeptically. And skeptically, I started to test him and set up more and more formal studies, and I couldn't beat the guy. I mean, it was really annoying. Um, I, I'm a card-carrying skeptic. I still am a skeptic. Um, a skeptic, incidentally, uh, to me, means somebody who's open. They're, they're believers, and they already think they know the truth. Mm -hmm. A skeptic doesn't. Right. And I can guarantee you, I don't know the truth. <laughs> well, so you know, you know more than most as of your research, but you'll tell us about that shortly. Yeah, I may know I may know some stuff, but the more stuff I know, the more I realize how little I know, and that I really don't understand how the world works. Believers have a tendency to actually think that the, that the way they understand the world is real, you know, and and they scare me a little bit. So there, there are people who believe everything I say is true, and there are people mm -hmm. who believe everything I say is false. I get scared with both of them because mm -hmm. the people who know I'm right, I don't know I'm right. <laughs> and the people who know I'm wrong, I'm probably wrong. You know, I, I'm, I'm really comfortable being wrong. I'm, 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 I, I don't need to defend beliefs. Uh, I don't have any left. You know, the research has taken me down crazy paths. So anyway, a long, long time ago, this guy was a psychic. Um, he was a psychic before I met him. Uh, I tried to test him. I tried to make it go away. I tried to control double blind, triple blind, you know, you name the, the methodologies and I, I applied it and he was real. He was, I mean, I sit here as a skeptic and I tell you, this guy was uh, astonishing. Now he, it turns out he turned into, well, he was doing his psychic stuff. He turned into a spontaneous healer. And he did that by when he was doing what we sometimes call psychometry, like token object reading, you know, mm -hmm. you hold a thing and you, you get stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what was alleged and not even deliberate was that when he was doing a reading on someone, if they had a physical problem, he would feel it. And what was happening is it would leave the person he was doing the reading on. Right. I didn't believe that. He didn't believe that. He didn't believe that. You know, he said, this is crazy talk. Even as you he know, was experiencing the symptoms. He was experiencing the symptoms. He's holding a, a, a thing and he's, he's getting symptoms. But then when the person says, you know, my condition went away, you know, at a particular time, it was like, what? What, what are you talking about? So he's telling me a story or two one day. We're sitting in the kitchen and I had gone uh, many years with a bad back, uh, just a chronic lower back pain, which is not good for me. I was a, a competitive swimmer. And I was actually I had to give up a college swimming scholarship uh, because my back wouldn't arch after about 100 meters. Uh, that's bad for a butterfly. <laughs> and so I walked around in pain virtually all the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't flop on the floor pain, but it was ow. You know, it'd get get your attention, and you're trying to figure out a way to get comfortable and all that stuff. And I was never comfortable. And this guy's telling me a story about this, and 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 I'm I'm sitting in pain trying to figure out how to do it. And I said, you know, you big dope, get this guy to fix your back. 
And right. so right away he said, ow, somebody has a back problem. And I let him squirm for a while, because why not? And, and then I said, uh, the pain is mine. And he said, keep your pain to yourself. And I said, better idea, fix it. And he said, how? And I said, beats the heck out of me. I'll lean over here on a table. You put your hands on my back. He said, then what? I said, then fix it. It was the last back pain I ever had. It was, it was interesting. So I, I had a choice. Mm -hmm. Pretend it didn't happen or try to figure out what happened. And for better or for worse, I went down the second road trying to figure out what happened. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's been a net gate or not, but it's been an interesting journey. Uh, and, and so I started first by dragging him around and putting his hands on people and doing this and seeing what mm -hmm. happens and some things responded and some things not so much. And, and I watched a few hundred healings and it was, it was interesting. I was among the healies and then I started to take part in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a healer, but why not? You know, so the two of us start going on the road together, healing the sick and raising the dead and, you know, doing all that kind of weird stuff. And, and, and we're oh, out so doing you, it. You began doing it alongside him. I thought that began later in the lab. You it became, no, it, it was before the lab. Uh, so okay. it, it, it was maybe under a year into his healing that I, 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 he said, you can do this. And I said, I what, do what, you know, and I started to team up with them and we started to do stuff separately and together. And I watched a few hundred healings, you know, at least, uh, mm -hmm. and they were interesting. And, and by healings, it doesn't mean that everything was miraculously fixed. It, it was a process of starting healing. It, healing began. Some things didn't seem to respond very much, like benign growths didn't respond to get excited about. Malignancies responded. And so malignancies went away. Benign growths kind of sat there and made fun of you. You know, and even stupid stuff like warts. Warts wouldn't go away. I mean, it's crazy, but you know, because pe pe people in the healing world say any idiot can do warts, you know, and we idiots can't. <laughs> <laughs> and so I watched and watched and watched, and, and I realized after, and, and now we're talking hundreds of healings, and we're talking at least a couple of years into it of watching this stuff, that I couldn't unravel what was going on. Mm -hmm. Because someone comes in, they have whatever condition they have, treatment happens, multiple treatments needed, you know, whatever might, whatever the pattern might be, and then they get better. Well. Was it the healing? You know, I'm a skeptic. Was it the healing? Was it a change in lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Was it just time? You know, things get better. Was right. it? Was it? Was it time? Was it? Was it? Was it? Was it? You know, and, and so we had a we had a. I realized I couldn't undo that. You know, so you come in in pain and you leave without pain, and maybe it was the grapefruit you ate. Mm -hmm. Maybe you took an extra multivitamin. Right or placebo. Maybe you didn't take the grapefruit. Right. Or you must have thought of the placebo effect as well, right? Yeah. And at the time, I thought placebos were psychological. I've, I've since unraveled placebos. I think I know how they work. Uh, mm. And and uh, but but at the time I was thinking, you know, maybe it's psychological. Maybe we're exaggerating, you know, mm -hmm. like telling a fish story. You know, the fish gets bigger and bigger each time I tell it. I, I brought in a huge fish, you know, kind, kind of thing. Uh, so I, I, with a buddy of mine, a geologist, uh, uh, we were sitting there watching and doing some healings and, and we started to talk and he said, and I said, we both said, we're not going to, this isn't going to work. All we have is people getting better, but we're mm -hmm. not understanding more. And the only way to understand more is to take it into the lab and do it under control conditions. Because there's too many other factors, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, any clinician knows that they're practicing an art because mm -hmm. they're trying their best to help a patient. Right, right. And by that time, you were already an expert in statistics or this happened along the way that you studied and became proficient in that field? Uh, it was it was during that time. I went, you know, went to graduate school, got a PhD, you know, did, did things like that. And, and so my specialty was quantitative analysis and, you know, so I designed well studies and, you know, it's, it's what I do. Right, so you were well suited for the for the task of creating these experiments. I don't know which came first, but yes, I this is my wheelhouse. I, I know how to do this stuff. Right, right. 
So then, so then what happened next? Once you began, you decided on, on mice and on a specific kind of, of cancer, strain of cancer that you were going to inject? Well, the question was rather, is there something that we could test and do that would have no viable counter hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Meaning, if we get this result, we know what we're doing. If we don't get, you know, so it's a yes or no, it's a thumbs up, it's a thumbs down. Right. And it's no, right. something that a lot of people would know about. So I think in very simple terms, I just, mm -hmm. I'm the village simplistic guy. And, and, and so what I, what I said is let's deal with a lab question that's already thought to be very well understood mm -hmm. and we can interject a single variable. Right. What happens if we bring healing into the mix. Mm -hmm. And so we hunted around and at City University of New York. Uh, we found a bio lab that had been working for 20 years on a particular mammary cancer in mice. And it turns out this mammary cancer in mice is the most common studied mouse model there is ever. Mm -hmm. There are literally over 2000 publications on this mouse. So you go look at the literature and everybody in oncology knows about this. And the, the general idea is you take a particular kind of a mouse, you inject it with a certain amount of cancer, it develops cancer, and 100% of them will be dead in a month. Mm -hmm. No exceptions. So researchers, you know, give the mice grapefruit, they take away the grapefruit, they run them in a wheel, they, they you know, give them chemotherapy, they give them radiation. They give them mm -hmm. vitamins, they take away vitamins, they do whatever they do, trying to get the thing to live longer. And I said, well, this is beautiful. You know, 100% of them die. Mm -hmm. and we know it. Everybody in, in, in biology knows about these mice. Let's take the mice, give them a lethal dose, and let's see what happens. Right. Nice and simple. So we gave them a lethal dose. By we, I mean a biologist. The biologist gave a lethal dose. I put my hands around a cage. I didn't expect anything like this to, to, to work. We just, let's find out what happens. And the tumors started to grow on the mice anyway. And I thought way back when, that if we got to the mice soon after injection and zapped them, you know, zzz, zzz, kind of a thing, if we zapped them and we got to it early, they'd never grow cancer if it was gonna work. But instead the tumor grew anyway. And I thought it was failing. And I tried to pull out of the experiment and I said, doesn't work. And my, my buddy who had helped set this up, he said, give it a couple more days. I said, what's the point? You know, it doesn't work. He said, a couple more days. Tumor got bigger and bigger. Then the tip of it ulcerated. And I have some pictures if you want to see disgusting things. And then the, it, the tumor ulcerated and then the tumor really ulcerated. And it looked like the, you know, the ugly things were happening to the mice. And I'm jumping up and down going, this doesn't work. I'm supposed to be the healer. This doesn't work. Yeah. But you kept doing days, it. A couple more days. Hmm. And then the tumor implodes suddenly. And the mouse is cured. Hmm. And it's not remitted. It's, that's not, that's a, that's a, a, a suppression of symptoms. It's mm -hmm. cured. It's cured in the sense that it, it, it's, immune to cancer for the rest of its life. It's got no more cancer cells in it and it's immune. Okay. And we can take blood from that mm -hmm. and put it into another mouse that is, has been infected and it'll cure that mouse too. That's incredible. So there's the memory of healing that's transferred from one mouse to another. And you can see the possibilities here of making a vaccine. Right, of course. And that's the reason that you talk about information rather than energy in your hypothesis of what's going on here, what, what is curing these mice, because you can transfer it from one to another? No, if it was information, it still might be transferable. Uh, that, that, that it's information and not energy is uh, primarily because there's no relationship to distance. Right. So okay. if I have a cage of mice sitting in front of me, or I have a cage of mice that's 100 kilometers away, or I have mm -hmm. a cage of mice that's 1,000 kilometers away, you get the same result. Mm -hmm. That can't be energy. Right, you wouldn't expect that with energy. Energy now, diminishes with distance. Right, right. 
um, I was wondering you if you could mention the phenomenon of what happened with the control mice that kept getting better as well, and what you had to do in order for that to stop happening. Yeah, well, what, what we found is that the, the, there's a there's a term that's currently in use, which is called uh, uh, locality. Mm -hmm. And locality recognizes discrete places where you are. And the opposite of locality is non-locality. Right. And non-locality implies things are connected. When you do an experiment, and let, whether you got mice or you got people or you got cells or you got whatever you got, and you, you, you split them up into various groups randomly, and then you do whatever you do, it's assumed that one group is independent of the other group. Of course. And that's that's one of the unstated assumptions of doing experiments. You know, everything is independent. You're over there. I'm over here, and and, and we take it from there. But it turns out what happens is under selected conditions, mice that are in our experiment get cured anyway, even if they're not the direct object of the treatment. And it's not a field effect. It's an actual targeted location. So if I have a cage of mice here and I'm treating them, mm -hmm. and there's a cage of mice over here that I'm not treating, and mm -hmm. these mice are somehow, I'm calling bonded, resonantly bonded, then a treatment given to this cage will end up being a treatment given to that cage. Okay, I thought, because I forgot to mention your book, which is called The Energy Cure, and which relates, which talks about all these developments. And I think you've mentioned there that one of the things that happened is that some of your, the students that you had trained to do the healings, one of them walked into the space where the control mice were. Yeah. And so you thought maybe that's what contaminated yeah. the specimen. Is that still what you think? Or do you think there's this, this resonant? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think what we're talking about here is the condition that we, that I now call resonant bonding. Mm -hmm. Is this a term you came up with, or did you yeah. get that from? Yeah, it, okay. It, yeah, I, I came up with it, and it, it's resonant bonding. It, people like quantum things, you know, talk about entanglement. This isn't entanglement; it's a, it's a bonding that everybody uh, listening now has experienced. I don't, you don't need to ask. And what what I mean by resonant bonding is you feel a connection to something, and then on another time you don't feel a connection to the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, what's changed? Well, the bond has changed. And you can experience that. So on Monday, you love your dog. And on Tuesday, you hate your dog. Now, it's not the dog. It's the bond. Hmm. I'm connected. I'm disconnected. And what we're talking about here are what are the rules, using that loosely, what are the rules, what are the patterns of connection and disconnection? So these and I think that that's what is actually going on here in healing Healing is connection. Healing is connection between healer and healee. Right. And I can actually show you that. I, I got EEG studies and functional MRI studies, and and, and 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 I can show you a connection. I can show you a biological, physical connection at a distance. And I think when you have that connection, if you have a bunch of mice that are connected. And how, you know, sorry, how are they connected? Because they came from the same, they were bred by the same. That's mm -hmm. the question. Hmm. That's the question. So if they're, if they're, I mean, they're biological, almost identical to each other, they're shipped together, they're raised together, they've always been together in the same box, and then they're split up into separate cages. I think okay. there's a residue of connection. I think you can also make a connection as the experimenter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, because so if, I, part... if I say this cage is my experiment, that cage is my experiment, that cage is my experiment, this cage is not. You know, and that's clear. I think that can actually, the consciousness of the experimenter can be a factor. But wouldn't that be a field phenomenon? No. No? Here, here's, it, it might be a field phenomenon, but I've actually tested that. And, and so what, what you have is, for example, I got a cage of mice here, or a bunch of cages of mice here that are treating in part of the experiment. And I have a bunch of the controls mm -hmm. that are someplace else in the building that I don't see. Right. And in the building between me and the controls are a bunch of other labs working on the same mice. In my experiments, my treated mice get better. My untreated mice, part of the resonant bond, get better. 
the exact same cancer model in mice between me and the others, nothing happens to them. They don't get affected at all. They die as they should. Sorry, these were others- a field effect, anything yeah. in that, that right. critical zone would, would, would produce healing. And it turns out healing is not produced by a critical zone. Okay, so these other mice, just to make it super, to, to have it very clear, were part of another experiment. They were being treated for by with other means. Other labs, other, other biologists, other, yeah, other But they were in the same building, but they were in adjacent rooms. Okay, yep. Yep. so I, I also read in your book that at some point you took um, some of your own mice to a very distant location. I don't know how, how distant it was. Do you remember? Yeah, I, I, I'm still not sure where it was because it was shipped. Uh, you know, I was kept blind to it. I think it was St. Louis. <laughs> wow. So that's, that's... Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it wasn't it wasn't next door. Uh, so okay. it, it, it was and when when you get them out of the field of influence, you break the bond, they all die. So so again, so but you your your hypothesis is that it was not the physical distance. It was the fact that they were now now separate from the environment where the experiment was taking place. You can break the bond. And okay. so bonding and unbonding is fluid. And again, mm -hmm. we go back, I love my dog Monday, I hate my dog Tuesday, I love my dog Wednesday, I hate my dog Thursday. You know, what's changing? Well, you can become bonded to a pet, you can become bonded and unbonded to a person, you can become bonded and unbonded to an idea, you can become right. bonded and unbonded to a place. You know, it's, it's everybody's this, experienced that. Right, but this doesn't seem to be an emotional connection, right, between the mice. It's some other kind of bonding that we can't exactly explain. I can't exactly explain it, no. I, I can't hold it together. I can see the gross bonding and unbonding and try to figure out how to do it. Uh, yeah. But I, I, you can, you, it, it turns out one of the ways to unbond, at least in, in a healing experiment, is to make the healer very anxious. Mm -hmm. And if you're very anxious, you know, you'll kind of pull away. Okay, makes and sense. So you can feel attraction, you can feel repulsion. If I'm anxious, I feel repulsion. Mm -hmm. I want to get out of the anxiety. I don't want to be here with these mice. These mm -hmm. mice will now die. Wow, that's incredible. That was part of the studies. You oh, yeah. Test, you yep. tested it. We've tested so. that. And when I say something, that means I've tested it at least in multiple labs independently. So I have replication. I'm very conservative in what I claim. Right. That's exactly what I was going to ask you next. Next, how many replications have you done so far? If you remember the exact number of oh, I, I am a I have a viable, vibrant research agenda going on now. I'm in four different universities right now. But uh, over so, the years. Oh well, it, 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 replications implies doing the same thing over and over. I'm not doing the same thing over and over. I'm trying to figure out what's going on and how and why. And you know, I've gone way past. Uh, okay. If you're if you read the energy cure that you know it's all it's interesting stuff but it's old uh, so it, yeah. it, you know, I, I just finished in mice I just finished my nineteenth and twentieth experiments at, in Tokyo oh, yeah I, I read about that and all of these so far have been significantly successful I mean the the results of the experiments uh, which we will go into in a moment. Um, you wouldn't say you've had a failed experiment in all these years, or or would you? Has, well, I, has... I would never say I've had a failed experiment because I do them I do them correctly, uh, and so the outcome is is always a surprise. Hmm. So that doesn't mean it's a failure. It just means I don't understand how the world works. I so know, but I mean, always as far... surprise. <laughs> Right. But as far as the healing, the results of the healing has been mostly positive throughout these three decades of experiment. Well, we, we, we've learned some things. For example, uh, this, this is a study at Brown University um, uh, where I'm also doing other research. Uh, but uh, at, at Brown, we, we dealt with uh, what are called nude mice. And nude mice are mice uh, specially inbred, so they don't have an immune system. Uh-huh. And you have to be very careful with them because, you know, if you sneeze, they die. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, they really have virtually no immune system. Mm -hmm. and, and so my hypothesis at the time, this is before I could do immunological studies. I've since done immunological studies. But before that, um, uh, since I didn't have access to uh, immunological studies, I said, let's get some mice that don't have an immune system and see if we treat them. My guess is they won't get killed 
because I don't think healing is mind over matter. I think he, healing is giving the healee, the body of the healee, what they need. Okay. And if you need to have, if you have cancer, mm -hmm. everybody has cancer. I mean, as far as I know, nobody's ever been found who doesn't have cancer. Mm -hmm. But it's not a disease. It just means you got cancer cells and your body gets mm -hmm. rid of it and your immune system does <coughs> amazing things. Mm -hmm. What happens if you don't have an immune system? I predicted the mice would die. So we did a, a series at uh, Brown University and the mice, you know, you gotta be real careful with them. We were very careful with them and we treated them as if you would treat normal mice and they did die. So when you say, did you replicate? No, that's not a replication. That was a of new course. mouse experiment. New, new study, right. New, new study. So in the 20 studies, I did, I did I, virtually identical studies five or six times before I could finally say, okay, I give up, it's real. And then I started it on different kinds of cancers. And then I, you know, and so each experiment is now new because I, I, I have no interest in just doing the same old thing over and over. Of course, makes, makes sense. Do you think uh, this is a good point for us to show a little bit about what those studies look like and the kinds of sure. findings you found in your early, you know, in, in your basic um, healing mammary cancer research? So I know you have um, some slides that you could share with us, and then perhaps we can go into um, the technique itself, the technique that you've developed. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share or just talk or whichever whichever works. So it, let me see yeah. if this works. Sure. Am I up there? Yes, that's perfect. And this is really about my, uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, they can, they can get the contact info here. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is really about my current work, which is trying to take healing mainstream. Right. Uh, I, I'm not particularly focused. I wouldn't say I'm not interested because it's it's an interesting area, but I, I, I'm not particularly focused on one on one healing anymore. I'm trying to make mass availability of healing uh, and to and to scale it. So, you know, that's that's really what I'm working on. So okay. let me see if I can get to I'll skip some things here. Sure. And that's up there. Yes, we can see it perfectly. Okay, so I, I'm looking, I mean, this is the general goal, you know, I've been doing this for 200 years. Um, uh, I, I'm looking at the parameters of healing and parameters of healing would be things like distance. Does mm -hmm. distance matter? Does that matter? Does the other thing matter? Uh, or psychological factors, does belief matter? Mm -hmm. You know, does it matter if the healer believes? Does it matter if the healee believes? And, and I'm reasonably confident, I'm probably wrong, but I'm reasonably confident that uh belief retards healing retards it it retards it yeah not not hugely it doesn't kill it but it it doesn't help uh a skeptical healer and a skeptical healee i think is the optimum that goes pretty much against the grain of everything that's been that's been taught in the area of, of intention yeah, yeah i know, yeah, I know I, I'm, not, I'm not i'm not saying it's my experience i'm saying i tested it <laughs> So the, so the believers did worse in, in their healing sessions. Yeah, I, believers aren't particularly good. You know, if you look at card carrying healers, you know, and that's their day job, they probably believe because it's what they do in the daytime. But right. they make the, the, the uh, mistaken leap of faith that it's their beliefs that has something to do with it. Hmm. You know, a, a, a neutral, skeptical, open-minded person on both the side of a healer and the healee, who just does it and let nature take its course, I think is optimum. That's interesting because in parapsychological studies, I've, I've read the opposite that- Yeah, uh, absolutely. What, what, they, yeah. what they call the sheep, you know, the believers tend to do better. Sheep and don't, yeah, sheep sheep don't, yeah. yeah, this isn't, this is not parapsychological stuff. Healing is not mind over matter. So the, the psychokinesis, okay. the PK that you're referring to, it doesn't hold in, in healing. Healing is, uh, it's a different animal altogether. Okay, yeah. so so let's, let's continue with, with your explanations. Okay, so so I, I mean, I just look into a whole bunch of parameters of healing. I look into the physiology of healing, what happens to the heart, what happens to the brain, what happens if you use EEGs, what happens to my slides, I can't find them. <laughs> 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 and well, this is in, in case anybody just because I have them here and so I'll just do a quick advertisement if anybody wants to read this the early story this is a little bit outdated but it, you know it's a 
it, it, it's a story of how I got here. If anybody wants to do it for themselves, mm -hmm. this is how you do it. I don't have a secret. Uh, all, my, all my techniques are public. They're published. Uh, mm -hmm. They're available to people. This is an actual training course. You can learn how to do this and get your own mice or get your own people and put out a shingle, do whatever you want to do. Um, uh, you can take a workshop, you can take a CD course, you can, so again, I, I'm not holding little secrets to, to the vest that I'm right. trying to keep from people. Uh, I encourage, there's, there's people all over the world who are replicating my stuff. Mm -hmm. And I can't seem to stop this. Okay. Now, if you're a geek, <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a lot of stuff on my website, thanks to research.com. I have a lot mm -hmm. of stuff on my website. That is, it's 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 not going to be stuff you take to the beach. You know, it's going to be a lot of geeky stuff and technical things like that. So you can read my stuff in English. You know, I try to be you know uh, available to. You don't need technical training, but some of these you really do need technical training. Uh, you Absolutely. get the idea. You can read around the geeky stuff, but you can see it. I think I have about thirty-five or so publications on my website. I have many more, but these are the ones you know I think that are most accessible. Uh, uh, to people. So let me let me show you the the general plot, and mm -hmm. I'll show you the 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 Please. some cancer pictures, and I'll mm -hmm. just do this very quickly. Here are the yes. places I've done cancer experiments with mice. Mm -hmm. I have many more with cell cultures, and I have you know, and I have clinical stuff, and I have all that stuff. So my first couple of experiments were at City University, and then we did it here, and then we did it here, and then we did it here, and then we did it here. So I got five uh, uh, studies at Brown Medical School just on these mammary cancer alone. So there's mm -hmm. a lot. I've got, I've looked into sarcomas, uh, and you can see I've been to a bunch of different med schools. I've looked mm -hmm. at oncogenic mice. There's my nude mice. I've looked at extremely aggressive mice. And now I'm, I'm looking at reproducing the healing without the healer. Right. Before we go into that, all of these yeah. studies are some, sorry, some of these studies have been published in scientific journals. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, so you can you can peer review scientific journal on my website until uh, your brains explode. I have I have two papers out for peer review right now. One mm -hmm. is uh, from my work in uh, Tokyo, uh, showing that you can reproduce biological effects without the healer, and you can do it by the recording of healing. Um, and I've got some, uh, we just did a clinical study on 160 people entering a COVID, a hospital for COVID and we, mm -hmm. we, we, with infused water, with the healing intention infused into the water, we did a double blind placebo controlled clinical study on COVID. Remarkable results. They healed in, in about a week's time, is that Oh, no, right? no, no. Uh, they, no. They start to turn around in a day. In a day? In a day. Okay. Yeah, then the PCR test shows doesn't show positive anymore, and the symptoms go away. I mean, it's pretty remarkable, and it's just from healing intended water. Right. So before we get to the to, the, to your latest research, research was it with water and cotton? Can we let's go to the mice and show? Sure, I'll show so a couple results. of quick ugly studies, and then you'll mm -hmm. you'll lead me where you want me to go. Yeah. Thank you. This is an example of a mouse about to die. Mm -hmm. It's ugly research. But so I also can't find it. Uh, it's ugly research. It is, this is, uh, if my portrait's in the right place, this is the tumor, it's eaten a leg. Uh, this mouse is not gonna last much more than a couple of minutes. Uh, if you can see the fur is falling out, if you can see the eyes, there's nobody home. It's, it's an ugly, this research can be pretty ugly. And then what we do is we dress people up. This I'm outing myself here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although I have volunteers who are who are uh, uh, students and faculty, I never put their their pictures up on a screen to keep their privacy. So I'll out myself. So this is me at Brown University. This is before COVID, incidentally. So I'm not dressed up for COVID. I'm dressed up to keep the lab clean. Mm -hmm. So you dress funny, and then you you put your hands over a cage or around a cage of mice. The mice are supposed to die. And so this is what's supposed to happen. But instead of this happening, after a little while, the tumor starts to, to have a slit. It opens up. Now that looks like the mouse is sick. This mouse actually has no cancer anymore. The cancer is gone. Now the mouse is just healing. You can see the fur is clean. 
-hmm. if you see the eyes, the eyes are sharp. They're mice running around a cage having a good time. And then this will eventually implode. There'll be no sign it ever had a, 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 a tumor. It'll have no sign it ever had cancer. It will be immune to cancer for the rest of its life. And it will live out the two years it's expected to live. It will live out the two years. No mouse has ever not lived the two years. It doesn't turn into Methuselah, you know, and, and live 10 years. It lives right. a normal lifespan. It just can't get cancer. And re-injected over the course of its life, uh, the immunity stays. So incredible. And if we look at this, you know, we, we could just say, here's stuff that has been independently verified, you know, in, in a number of labs uh, that, that distance is irrelevant. Do there is a dose response, you know, there are real thing that cures all over the place. It's not generic field. Belief is irrelevant. Placebo type effects occur, you know, and on and, and you know, and I could keep going, but you get you get the general idea. Every one of these statements is is backed up, is it can be or is already published in peer reviewed scientific journals. Uh, yeah. I can I can defend any of these. Sorry, um, one thing I don't understand this: the, how the placebo effect work with mice. If you do human studies, and I'm going to get rid of this so we can talk. Yeah, sure. If if you do human studies, and there's there's whole divisions of universities devoted to studying placebos. If you do placebo studies, you get a modelable placebo effects. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're doing a drug test, and we we're testing whatever drug, and again we're assuming locality, and we we split them up, and we do something here. Well, placebos. Here's some dirty little secrets about placebos. A placebo effect is directly proportionate to the strength of the drug used. Really? Yeah, Never let that been. sink in. Yeah, that is so strange. How? How? It's also you something you don't want people to know. So, because how, that, how do you think how, that's psychological? So I give X dosage here and I get X placebo effect. If I replicate this with two X, I get two X placebo effect. Now the right. placebo people don't know this, right? But it's going along because placebos are not psychological. They're a bonding to the resident, the residents of the treated wow. group. That's mind blowing. That is mind blowing because the placebo effect has been studied extensively, hasn't it? Yeah, poorly. Wow. Now, if you do my mice, you get the same placebo model that you do in people. And I don't I get think the mice believe. Okay. I get if you do it with cell cultures, I get placebo effects that are exactly the same as humans and mice in cell so cultures. And my latest study, which I haven't published, I have placebo effects in placebos themselves. Oh my God, that's that's too much. Wait, just one moment. Let's backtrack for just a moment. How would you go about creating a placebo that that would substitute for or stand in the place of energy healing? Is somebody using their hands, laying their hands on, but not intentioning healing? What's the placebo? In oh, the stages? placebo effect. I think if let's say let's say you're in the drug treatment group, we're in the trial and there's a bunch of you and there's a bunch of me and I'm in the placebo group. You don't know you're in the treatment. I don't know I'm in the placebo, but I have an awareness a focus that I'm part of this study. Right. The, the but, bonding comes from consciousness itself. Yes. Now, whether the consciousness comes from the experimenter, the consciousness comes from the, the participants, the identification with this group, mm -hmm. we're doing a group study. That's what an experiment is. We're doing a group right. study. Mm -hmm. We're already setting it up to be bonded. Yes, I get that. What I'm not sure I get is how you're creating a placebo situation because there's no pill or anything to replicate. So what, how is one group is getting the actual energy healing and what's the other group getting? Nothing. Uh, sometimes they get a sham healer who doesn't know the okay. technique. And they okay. put their hands around and they wave and they get whatever they do. And sometimes they get nothing. So it depends whether it's an active control or a passive control. And okay. we do both. Uh, okay. Sometimes we have six mice rooms going at the same time. Oh, wow. Okay. All so six get cured. 
even if everybody doesn't know about all six. That is so crazy. Just since you mentioned the technique, let's go to, to your technique because I understand from your book that when you began healing mice, you didn't you hadn't come upon your present technique, which is image cycling that I'll ask you to explain in a moment. So what you were doing the zapping. So you were doing just doing anything that came to your mind. No, no, no. The the, the mantle, the uh, image cycling came before the mice got there. Oh, okay. So you were yeah. doing that as well as oh, this yeah. zapping yeah. thing. We were practicing image cycling long before we got mice because we were doing it oh. on people. We were okay. doing, you know, and so we were doing the image cycling. I'm doing the image cycling right now. You Are haven't you? seen me not doing it. That's incredible. How did you come upon, and if you could briefly explain what image cycling is, and how did you come upon this technique? The real short version is the, the crazy guy who annoyingly fixed my back. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my, my life took a turn. You know? <laughs> before and after. Yeah, it's about yeah, before back and after back. Uh, the, the crazy guy, the psychic crazy guy, uh, I, this is the short version. Basically, I wanted to know what he was doing when he was healing mm -hmm. and what was going on. And he could answer those questions if I phrased the question correctly. And the, the natural follow up to it was, can anybody do this? Or, you know, are you a mutant or can anybody do this? Or is, you know, is, do you have like an extra toe or, you know, is, is there some, some, something weird about you? And, and he would start blurting spontaneously and listen as he was speaking. So he'd go, what did I just say? You know, and, and so uh, he was a spontaneous blabber. Like, <laughs> and then we're trying to figure out what he just said. Uh, so I spent some many months working at, at honing the right question, trailing around him and trying to figure out, because he was then eventually claiming what nothing he does is particularly special. Anybody could do it. Here's how you do it. And that's what the CD set is. Here's how you do it. That's what the but, workshop are. Here's how you do it. So he was image cycling from the beginning? He was image cycling too. So we both... I think it would be fair to say without him, we wouldn't have image cycling. I think it would be equally fair to say without me, there'd be no image cycling. Right. So the image cycling, which we should describe immediately or define so people know what we're talking about. So basically, it's this, this list of wishes, right, that you that you come up with and that you learn and memorize and then go through as quickly as you can. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. Yeah. So it, it's uh, we're, we're looking for shooting to begin with about 20 images of very concrete things that you can know whether you have it or not. So this okay. is a future event that doesn't now exist. Mm -hmm. So let's say I want uh, a fancy car. I don't know what kind of, you know, I want a Mercedes fancy, I don't know cars, the Mercedes fancy things. I can have an image of me driving that Mercedes only if I don't have it, because I want to be in the future where it exists and I'm in it. Okay. And it can't be vague generalities. Vague generalities would be things like, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has no meaning. Mm -hmm. You can't I imagine it or, or check that it happened. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have the Mercedes or I don't. Mm -hmm. I might be happy today and not so happy tomorrow. Does that mean it fit? You know, I mean, it, it, it uh, happiness is not stable enough. It's a, it's a vague generality that people can hang their hat on and, and okay. without committing themselves. So the list can include things or experiences or emotions, any yeah. range of, okay. Oh, yeah. And, and so what's the basis for the speeding up? Because as I said, I, I understand that the, the, the basic idea is just try to memorize them quick, more and more quickly until you can no longer really actually see any of the images or yeah. maybe sporadically. Is that right? So how did you come up on this idea of speed, which seems so counterintuitive as far as, you know, meditative or contemplative practices go? Yeah. Which I know uh, and again, without, without a teacher and without a uh, relying on past things that were thought to be known or scholarship or anything like that, in the question and answer process, it turns out, and the experience of it, that the faster we did this, the calmer okay. it got and the easier it got. And it turns out fast is easier than slow and fast mm -hmm. is easier to get away to to forget about and become mindless. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, learning this list is, is a, it's a pain. It's annoying. It's you got to practice and all that stuff. 
and you have to do any skill. You know, if I were giving you a tennis lesson, uh, I can't just hand you a racket. You know, I gotta, I gotta drill. I gotta practice. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. Same thing with this until you transition from mindful to mindless. Because hmm. everything you're good at, you're mindless about. Right. Um, that's an interesting take on um, it, comparing it to to mindfulness, because mindfulness is is actually putting your attention on something, and this this is kind of taking your attention away, right? Or well, getting your but, but mindfulness is is an exercise for the conscious mind. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not an exercise for competence. So I, for example, when I was, I don't know, an infant or a little little kid trying to take my first steps walking, I was mindfully walking. And I look like an idiot, you know, I take a step, fall, take a step, fall. And then suddenly there's a transition and I, I have mindlessly walked ever since. Right. So okay. I don't pay attention to walking, but I could mindfully walk if I want to as an exercise for my conscious mind, but it's not mm -hmm. going to help me walk. Exactly. Right. So the idea or the, the main purpose of this image cycling practice was to get the conscious mind out of the way so that something else that I yep. suppose you can't explain could happen as as you were doing this and it's, in this sense it is kind of a meditative technique because you are getting your conscious mind out of the way which is also in a way what many meditative practices aim for to to eh. let the let the thoughts go you know, i'm doing like, it right now I, i'm going uh, I, I'm, I'm slowing down for the effect of slowing down but i'm doing several hundred images a second and why are you doing it now because i like it it, it makes no sense to me ever not to do it. So I'm just going nice and coasting along, but I'm completely present with you. Mm. This is going on in the background in the exactly the same way that you and I could go walk down the street and neither of us would pay attention to our walking. We'd be right. fully present and conscious, but just not about our walking. I'm mm -hmm. fully present and conscious, just not about cycling. Cycling is going on. I'd have to look down at my feet to see if I'm walking. I'd have to pay attention to see if I'm cycling. And it turns out, yes, I am. Right. So and you I just can measure that and I can see what happens physiologically to me. You know, mm -hmm. and again, we've done pretty extensive testing on this stuff. Yeah. And I, I think you mentioned in your book or somewhere that this is not the first time that, uh, that maybe there was some Buddhist meditations that ha or meditators that would would make would make their their brain waves go faster rather than slower which is what you would expect with normal meditation and do you know could you just tell us a little bit about this what's going on in the brain when you're cycling well it, it, it's 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 reasonably interesting um we do this by eeg and functional mri um and we got ekg and other other stuff hooked up to you too but uh what happens when you start to cycle is your brain puts out and and the people I've worked with and in the EEG lab say they have never seen this signal. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but they've never seen what happens to the brain when you cycle. And what happens is you get a spike that's very intense, and you get a harmonic. Okay. And so the spike starts your brain essentially starts to harmonize with itself. And the interesting thing is, if I'm cycling and I think of you and you're hooked up, that appears in your brain. Wow. So that's now, again- It's not like you're going around going, oh, there he is again. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to tell, but there would be yeah, an effect. It, yeah, but but if you're hooked up to the right equipment, it, it turns out that you can see and watch and, and, and do all that uh, and, and see, and you can turn it on, you can turn it off. And our brains essentially, if we're healing, we go into something that would best be described probably as phase locking, because there's so many intercorrelations between our brains. When you cycle and think of the person, essentially you're locked in. Mm -hmm. I think that's when the healing happens. Now we're also going to do it with little EE. This is true. We're going to do it with little EEGs on mice. Oh my God! But the mice aren't cycling, so that would be. Well, the we're first trying to train them to. You know, they, I can't get them to make a list. <laughs> So, um, so again, um, to recapitulate, so you're you're seeing all these images or or having them pass very quickly by you, and this is getting your consciousness, your conscious mind out of the way, and something else is happening. But then 
also you, you came upon reports of people saying that things on their list started to appear in their lives. Yeah, it's crazy somehow. stuff. It's crazy stuff. But this is not something you've studied. This is just something that anecdotal evidence that you've Yeah, I, I, I don't. We, we got anecdotal experience all over the place, you know, so <laughs> people all over. And actually, some people put the stuff on their list. And again, they're recognizable or not. I want to be healthy or something like that. It, 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 they get the car. They get the. They get the. They're in the place they wanted to visit there, and and uh, it, it just seems extraordinarily coincidental that when the stuff starts to I don't know materialize. Mm -hmm. Now I did do a study and take the cycling out of the experiments. And what happened? The mice died. Incredible. So that's the, reasonably so the interesting. Technique, so the technique matters. It's not just anybody doing anything. It's it's not because there's nothing good on TV. This thing really changes you physiologically. This thing changes you healing wise. Cycling is not a healing technique. Cycling is simply a technique and it has certain benefits. One, you get the stuff on your list. Two, you learn about yourself. Just by doing your making up your wish you list, you can't cycle fast on things that you really don't want. Oh, that's interesting. That's it what people have. Work. It'll, it'll stop, and there, there are therapists using cycling as a as a psychological therapy, so that people learn about themselves. So let's go back to the uh, the Mercedes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I personally have, would have no interest in a fancy car. I just don't care about it. Mm -hmm. If I put a fancy car on my list, my list won't go. Now I'm supposed to want a fancy car because you know if I don't have one I'm a loser, uh, and I'm so I'm supposed to have a fancy car, but the reality is I don't want one, and so I learn about myself. I thought I wanted one, but I don't. Right, so that's an interesting side effect um, or added benefit. So you tried only with image cycling. You haven't tried with other healing techniques such as Reiki. You haven't gone into those other fields. Okay, mm -hmm. and so far. You focused mostly mostly on cancer, and I'm wondering if you've tried um, any of these tech. Well, actually, the image cycling technique on other disorders and diseases such as autoimmune yes. disease. Haven't yes, uh, and and uh, I, I I've been doing clinical studies lately, uh, uh -huh. and that's taking the healer out of the equation and and you know infusing, but. Uh, uh, we can talk in generics of things which we're good at and things which we're not so good at, but even those have exceptions, you know, so okay. we're okay. very good with malignancies, right? not good with benign growths. Mm -hmm. right. Age seems to matter. So if you're 110, you don't heal as well as if you're 10. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, but again, I, it's hard to make that comparison clinically because it's not under control conditions. You know, who knows what, you know, the 10 year old to the 110 year old, we're guessing, you know, because so, they're, they're not identical. We're good at, we're, we're good at, at taking things away that you don't want. We're less good at giving, stimulating the appearance of things that are missing. Hmm. Okay. So if, if you're missing something and you have Parkinson's, mm -hmm. We're not great at it. That's segregating. Okay. That's if you have Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. we can get rid of the plaques. Alzheimer's is easy. Mm. So well. we're good at Alzheimer's, but even that doesn't hold because we're good at Alzheimer's. We've taken people who haven't gotten out of bed in 20 years from serious clinical depression and fixed them with bipolar. I mean, I can, I can just keep going. How long do those treatments generally last, for example, for depression? How many treatments? Yes. Oh, I'm about to start, I hope, a clinical uh, study on depression. There's too much individual variation for me to answer. So uh, we have had, let me, let me go to, let me go to serious, this is easier to measure cancer, you know, because we got markers, we got, you know, tumor mm -hmm. size, we got all that stuff. I've taken a stage four liver cancer, mm -hmm. and this is an extreme case, so this isn't typical, fixed in five minutes. This I've taken a stage four lymph 
breast, et cetera, et cetera, which required two hours a day, seven days a week for months. Mm. I have nothing. Now, the same is true with mice. Because again, the pattern in mice is the same as people. So we can have, this is a real case, a cage of two mice. The mice are basically clones of one another, not literally, but close enough. They're clones of each other. They got cancer on the same day. They're the exact same age, so they, you know, everything is the same. Mm -hmm. And they got one healer. They've never known anything but each other. And they got the one healer. One mouse will take X number of days to be cured. One will take two and a half X. So there's just variants that you can't explain. Yeah, okay. so that, that, that's actually the lingo that that's, we statisticians use. We get unexplained variants. Mm -hmm. we, and unexplained variants is, is code for, I got nothing. <laughs> that's really what it means. I got nothing. I understand. So specifically what I wanted to ask to, to round up our talk is how, where is this going towards now? In, in the sense of, are you, you're working with humans now? But are you doing replicable studies? I understand you can't work with cancer in, in with humans in the lab, especially because you've mentioned that if people are getting chemotherapy and other treatments, it doesn't seem to work. So well, that's, that's changed. That's changed since the book. That's it? Oh, really? yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's, that's hopeful. The book is, I, I, I don't mean to put myself down, but the book is very outdated. Um, uh, okay. We've got way, in fact, this, in the next couple of months, I got to start a follow-up because it's, so many other things I think very differently than I did when way back okay. when, when when this was written and I've learned so much more and I've had so many hundreds of experiments right uh, so, so so now you've so now you've had success with people undergoing other yeah, conventional yeah. treatment okay yeah but, and, and if if we were talking in 2010 I would say no you don't want to combine healing and killing and all this kind of stuff I was given a workshop once uh and there was a, a bunch of people that'll learn how to do this. Uh, and I always say, you know, well, I'm giving you my experience and I'm giving you my experiments, but I'm not giving you everything. I don't know everything, you know, so <laughs> when in doubt, play, try for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. don't, don't follow me, don't listen to me, do it better than me. You know, it doesn't mean, because I can't do it, doesn't mean you can't do it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and so let, let's do that. So one guy in, in the audience said, uh, yeah, I think you're a loser. Uh, I think I could take someone who's had serious chemotherapy and radiation and treat them to cure. I said, no, you can't. And he goes, well, let me find out. And he did one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And the interesting thing, and this is in a Sheldrake kind of a fashion, since he broke that barrier, all sorts of people everywhere are doing it. Incredible. More for genetic fields. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, that's and, astounding. And, and I would have to agree with Rupert on this one. You know, breaking that, you know, the insurmountable, you, nobody will ever run a four minute mile and high schoolers could do it. You know, nobody right. could ever do it with kids. So the, 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 anything that you've read that I've, anything I've read, written mm -hmm. will be wrong <laughs> in the sense Eventually. that I'll say, cha I'll change my thinking over the course of time. That's amazing. And I like that in your book, you actually say that you, you extol people to outdo you and, and try new things. That's amazing. So, but are you doing controlled laboratory experiment? I mean, I don't know if you can call them laboratory experiments but with people um, yes. trying to heal and you're doing this and has, have those studies been published in, in medical journals? Uh, no, I, I have, I have three clinical trials of a hundred each, two in the States and one in Europe. Uh, on a, a wide variety of things. It wasn't a targeted condition. So there were people with cancer and people with Parkinson's and people with MS and people with, you know, and they had a, they had a bottle of stuff and they took my, uh, the, the, the drops that are supposed to work as a surrogate for uh, healers sublingually and for eight weeks and we gathered all sorts of medical data on them. 98% reported improvement. I mean, this is bizarre. This is, this is water treated but with your technique of image cycling and water then treated with with the technique and put through a device that'll mass produce it. So okay. in order to make healing conventional, it has to you got to have at least two things. It has to be able to be stored, mm -hmm. has to be able to be scaled. Right. So I've done experiments where we go into a Faraday cage. Mm -hmm. And we have three people 
in the Faraday cage, treating a piece of cotton, which we've used as surrogates in a lot of things. And we run 38 different detectors, because we don't know what we're doing, through a supercomputer and reduce it to a wave file. And we mm -hmm. play that wave file, for example, to cancer cells and see what happens. And we play it to mice. Mm -hmm. And so the recording that we've made, and these are not cheap things that we put together, the recordings that we've made, uh, we've replicated seven times at Brown University to cell cultures in an incubator. And we looked at we looked at 167 genes over a course of time series of exposures, and 68 of them reliably change when they expose to this thing that you can't hear. So it's a recording. Telomere length is increased. Apoptosis is upregulated. The immune system is generally upregulated. I mean, you, and and so we're looking at the biological mechanism of action uh, that goes on. We then play this recording to mice and the mice tumors ulcerate. Incredible. Now, it turns out, it's interesting, that the recording that we made is not as strong as hands-on live. It's so maximally scalable because if I can perfect this recording, I can upload it into the cloud and it would be globally scalable. Mm -hmm. And then if you, you don't wanna be sick, Listen to it. If you want to be sick, don't listen to it. You know, I'm okay either way. I'm not trying to save the world, but I'd right. offer the world you want to be fixed. Hmm. Okay, not? but we're not there. We're not there yet, right? Not You're there still, yet. still testing, right? I'm still so, testing. So we did it with, we did 300 people uh, with water, and I just finished a double blind placebo control study. It's out for peer review right now in a medical journal um, uh, on 160 COVID patients on their way into the hospital. So these aren't people with casual conditions, they're being hospitalized. Right. And it was That's double blind, placebo control, Have 80 people got fancy drops and 80 people got unfancy drops, it's all water. Mm -hmm. um, it was double blind, the physicians giving them out didn't know what they were getting, the patients didn't know what they were getting, and the data are absolutely remarkable. So the PCR test goes negative in, in, in very quickly. The, the symptoms disappear very quickly. But this is, no only the one, is this only in the people getting the actual drops, not on the yes. control? Oh, so some of the controls, no, some of the controls got better, you know, over a long period of time. So the resonant bonding would still be there, maybe. I got to test that. So I have a, I have a test for resonant, it's possible the resonant bonding. But, but people, the vast majority of people get COVID, even if they're hospitalized, don't die from it. They just, they got a sore throat, they got a cough, they got a, they got a, they got a, well, this was and a, then eventually it diminishes. If you compare what happens if you take our water versus, yes. I mean, they diminish much. I mean, it's, it's, it's not okay. subtle. And the, and the virus goes undetectable very quickly. Very quickly. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, to round out our talk, that what I'd like to ask you is, I know how difficult it must have been to carry out this research because of the mainstream um, prejudice against these topics that are so out there and unexplainable. Is it getting easier? Is there? Is, do you notice more more scientists more amenable to hearing about these? I, th I think so. Yeah. Uh, as as w with the Society for Scientific Exploration, you know, I just gave up twelve years of the presidency of that. Uh, that's the group that does, you know, studies unorthodox things. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the society was started 30 something years ago because nobody could say, talk about unorthodox things out loud. And so the uh, amenability to orthodox, unorthodox things, I think, has loosened a bit. But there are still institutionalized rejection of the ideas. You're, you're not allowed to talk about it in some places. I'm doing research right now. One of the places I'm in is a major research center in the States. I can't tell you what it is because they don't want anybody to know because they're, you know, supposed to be the hip and cool place. Mm. You know, Brown University is not exactly a second rate place, you know, but it, it, and so I've been in Brown Medical School. I've been in Indiana Medical School. I've been in University of Connecticut. Med you know, I, I'm not I'm not doing this in the backyard. Uh, and and uh, so the the people are interested in, but they're quietly interested in, mm, right? Because and if you say you talk about this stuff outwardly, 
and you draw attention to yourself, it can have ramifications. So there is a social impact of, are you a real scientist or are you doing that hocus pocus crap? Right, and people are still getting punished for it. I mean, their, their careers are- They're still are getting suffering. punished, but I, it, it's opening up, you okay. know, the, the, the cracks are opening a little bit. There's a little bit more funding. I mean, so this stuff isn't cheap to do, you know, and right. I've been very, very, very fortunate that money is thrown my way you know, and, and to make the recording, it just to make a little five minute recording was certainly over $300,000. Oh my God, okay. So so that's quite a, a service that you're doing to humanity if this pans out and you can make it scalable as you're trying to do, um, that would be an incredible contribution. It's already an incredible contribution. So Bill, this has been so fascinating and I, I hope we can do this again at some point because I have many more questions, but I don't wanna take you, um, take much more of your time. Um, I, I really hope society pays attention and more people become interested and open their minds to all your findings and other colleagues of yours that are working in the same field. It seems too important not to pay attention to. So- Thank you, but you know, people can read the stuff. Go, go, go to the website and read papers. Yeah, I know, but we we do need to get the word out there. So thank you so much for doing this, especially for the Spanish speaking public. And um, I hope we'll talk again soon. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And congratulations on your work.